Making it available for $200 also to help the work that we have in Vietnam. And uh, it's rare. My daughter said I could do this. She, you know, some of your children may want to keep all that for themselves. But I said, you see these on the wall? That's yours. And I'm going to make this available for the children of God as I travel so they may have an opportunity to have some treasure as well to put on their wall. Amen. Yeah. NASA was very good to give us a VIP tour. And it was a surprise for me that they did a video announce a video presentation. They asked me questions and we went through all of that. So now they got our names right. So in the future, I guess all the NASA's will understand that there are names to, to those frogmen in those wetsuits. Before it was just wetsuits. <laughs> and if you ever look at an encyclopedia or if you see the Look magazine back there or if you go out to Washington, D.C. and uh, the Air and Space Museum and you see any pictures of frogmen that they say were on Apollo 11 and if they don't have the flowers on their wetsuit, it's not me. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's go on to our presentation. We thank all the guests for coming out. I'm just curious, anybody from the SEAL team come out today? No SEALs here? All right, well, I was kind of hoping that uh, God would repeat the blessing that took place 50 years ago amongst the SEALs where I was a part, because God poured out his spirit in a wonderful way, and I'll talk more about that towards the end of my message. Could I just see the hands of our guests today first time? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Praise God. All right, let's see if these gadgets work. They do. In my lifetime, well, I thought they did. There they go. In my lifetime, I remember the Mercury launches. Then came the Gemini, then the Apollo. Then came along the space shuttles. And today, NASA's working on the Orion project. President Trump has initiated what they call the Space Force, and not to mention all these independent contractors that are wanting to take civilians into outer space. The space race began in 1957 with a Russian Sputnik, and it was the first to circle the Earth, and that was basically a satellite, and the United States followed that same year with what we call the Explorer 1, and it was also a satellite. It was then that President Dwight Eisenhower signed a public order creating what we know today as NASA. In April of 1961, the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first person to orbit the Earth in the Vostok 1, and the United States' effort to send a man into space was through the project Mercury. And of course, uh, they tested the craft with chimpanzees, Today, it probably wouldn't be politically correct to do that. <laughs> and it held the final test flight in March 1961, uh, just before the Soviets were able to pu uh, pull ahead in the space race with Gargarin's launch. On May 5th, 1961, the astronaut Alan Shepard became the first American in space. Though it wasn't an orbit around the Earth, he went straight up, and then he came straight back down. Later that May, President John F. Kennedy made the bold public statement that by the end of the 60s decade, we'll land a man on the moon. And he did that back in 1961, and uh, nine years later, it came to pass. In February of 1962, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. And by the end of that year, the foundations of what we know today as NASA uh, came into play, and they began the Project uh, Apollo. The Apollo suffered a setback January of 1967. I was a senior in high school then, when three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chaffee, were killed after the spacecraft caught fire during a launch simulation. In 1961, I'm going back there because when that Mercury flight, what was called Liberty Bell 7, sunk uh, in the ocean with Gus Grissom, opened the door, a wave got inside, and that capsule sunk down into the Atlantic. And uh, a few years back, they were able to retrieve that. But from that point on, they called on 
frogmen such as myself to help uh, secure these capsules with a flotation bladder and also to help protect the astronauts in case uh, uh, they were to get into the water and drown. I was in Vietnam 1968 out on a barge way down deep in the Mekong Delta. It was Christmas Eve. I was listening to the Armed Forces Radio, uh, listening to Christmas carols, and when that station was interrupted, and these astronauts, William Anders, Jim Lovell, Frank Borman, Apollo 8, were circling around the, the moon at the time, and they were uh, reading from the book of Genesis. A little did I understand at that time, while rejoicing with what America was doing, that when I returned back to uh, California, that our team would be called upon to help rescue and recover Apollo 10 and Apollo 11. Uh, we had three complete teams, four frogmen on each team, and then we also had three helicopter crews that we worked with. We all trained together. Uh, there was a primary team, which I was on. There was a sea anchor man who had entered the water first and put the anchor on the capsule to stabilize it. Two more men would drop in with a flotation collar, and then the fourth man would come in and, and put on one of those biological isolation garments. Uh, to help uh, decontaminate the capsule. NASA ha had put in place a uh, de contamination project where everything had to be washed down. The Navy made sure that we could do our jobs backward and forward. They sent a boilerplate that looked just like the capsule to San Diego and out into San Diego Bay. We rehearsed dozens of times, uh, learning how to jump out of uh, the helicopters and so forth. Uh, getting acclimated to our job over and over again until we could almost do it verbatim. They provided uh, the helicopter crews from the North Island base there and we worked with them. After we rehearsed there, we flew to uh, Hawaii <clears throat> and we boarded what is called today the USS Hornet Museum out in Almeida and we were very excited to board her. During, there's been eight of those uh, commission ships, and during World War II, this particular one is credited with destroying 1,410 Japanese aircraft. She came under fire 59 times, yet she was never hit. Uh, while aboard ship, everyone continued to, to rehearse their jobs. Um, we assumed the role of the astronauts so that uh, uh, the helicopter crew could learn how to retrieve them out of the raft in the ocean up into these helicopters. The bosun's mates honed their skills, and uh, the radio men fine-tuned their communication skills, and the quartermasters, of course, practiced their navigation skills. And uh, there were various military, civilian, and NASA personnel on the ship all doing the work there. The imminent blast-off mesmerized the world America was invaded down there at Cape Kennedy by over a million people. And uh, if you ever seen any of those films of the people that were gathered in there, it's just amazing to see. They brought their campers and they're sleeping out on the beach in sleeping bags and so forth, all to see that blast off. And the president uh, was in the Oval Office at the time watching that. And for eight solid days, Three men in spacesuits held the world captive, front page headlines, hogged the news, and of course, those that were on the USS Hornet, we didn't have uh, satellite in those days, there was no live television to watch. Uh, we got our information from the shortwave radios, daily briefings, and once in a while they would fly in some newspapers from Honolulu and we'd get a day or two old news to, to read. Uh, the moon landing outside of, uh, few outside of Houston realize that uh, landing on the moon almost was a disaster. When about 1,000 feet to go, Armstrong's lunar module guidance system was leading them towards some big boulders. And with only 30 seconds left, uh, he took over controls and he found a place to land safely there. And uh, they, they documented the heartbeat of Neil Armstrong. It was normally about 98, and it went up to 145 about <laughs> that time. Close to 30 million American households watched the moon landing on their TVs, and millions of households stayed up to watch part of the moonwalk. 
at 9.56 p.m. Houston time, um, there were uh, millions of people watching Neil Armstrong walk down, and he said those infamous words, it's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And over 500, me people, 500 million people worldwide watched the televised moonwalk. And then they returned to Earth after rendezvous with the Columbia. They headed back to Earth. The entry corridor into Earth's atmosphere is extremely critical. Too steep an entry would burn them up, and too shallow an entry would make them skip out into outer space, never to be seen again. Splashdowns are um, very highly dependent upon good weather. We had good weather right up until the night before the splashdown. Uh, there were thunderstorms in the area, and uh, NASA decided that we needed to relocate uh, just the night before, and so 250 miles away was the location, and the Hornet had to steam all night long in order to get there, which made our job much more difficult because of the high swells and so forth. But the astronauts began to feel the effects of gravity as they sped 25,000 miles per hour towards Earth, and the weight of the gravity continued to increase until they felt the effects six times the pressure of normal gravity, driving them harder and harder into their seats. And just inches away from their backs, protected by the heat shield, the bottom part of that capsule there, uh, there was 5,200 degrees Fahrenheit uh, that they had to deal with, that uh, the heat shield protected them from burning up on the inside. And then the astronauts felt uh, a, a jerk as the 16-foot drogue chutes opened up to help stabilize the capsule uh, just before the three main chutes would open up. And uh, the Apollo 11 command module traveled 952,700 miles in eight days, three hours, 19 minutes. And uh, can you believe this? They landed just 18 seconds behind the flight schedule. That's after they changed the location and all of that. And it was within 2.5 miles from where they thought it would land in the ocean. And that's with the drift of the parachutes and all of that. So uh, pretty amazing. Our helicopter crew, uh, being the primary crew, was about 10 to 12 miles away which meant that it didn't look like we were going to get in the water. There was another uh, helicopter crew with uh, the four frogmen backups right there on site. But uh, the capsule uh, turned upside down. What happened was Buzz Aldrin was supposed to throw a lever that would jets in those big parachutes, and uh, he, his hand was knocked off the lever, so the wind and the chutes turned that capsule upside down and what we would call a stable two position. And they had to inflate these balloons with little uh, levers on the inside. And it took a few minutes for that capsule to upright. Our helicopter's racing as fast as they can to the site. Uh, the walls are just shaking. Those pilots wanted to be the ones. The frogmen on the inside of the helicopter wanted to be the ones to get in the water. And we made it just in time as it uh, arrived up in an upright position. That crew that was right above the capsule drooling, anticipating them being on the recovery, were told to move out of the way. And uh, our helicopter came above and I was the first man in the water. That is the actual sea anchor bag and it's back there on the table. That held a little parachute. My job was to jump into the water, swim up to the capsule, and attach it to that. There is video online, and uh, we have one right now, the Frogman's role in the recovery on YouTube. And I looked this morning, and it has 103,000 views and growing. And uh, you can see the challenge that I had as I, I approached that capsule. It's moving up and down with the swells. And if that would have knocked me on the head, I wouldn't be here sharing this with you. But there was a parachute, it opened up underneath the capsule. Out in the ocean, there's a current and that capsule would be moving along and that, that parachute would stabilize it and slow it down so 
two others could jump in with a 200 pound flotation collar and we uh, attached that. Then there, because of the back contamination procedure set up by NASA, uh, we were on open scuba. That meant when I jumped in and my teammates jumped in, they had a, a 50 pound uh, tank on and that sea anchor weighed about seven pounds. So it was kind of difficult to swim with all that on. And we uh, inflated two rafts. One raft was upwind where we're sitting because of the contamination procedure set up. And then you can see that Billy Pew net coming down, that fourth frogman, you can barely see him there. He doesn't have a wetsuit on, but in that Billy Pew net is a biological isolation garment for him to put on. He's got three others for the astronauts. And then when he got close to the capsule, uh, you can see him there in his big suit and he's scrubbing down the rafts and so forth. And you can see him there with the canister. He's scrubbing down the capsule to make sure uh, there is no moon pathogens that would contaminate Earth. Somebody said, well, if he came back 25,000 miles an hour, wouldn't that kill all the germs? Probably would. <laughs> but on the inside, uh, they have moon rocks and samples, and they were concerned more about that. So the hatch door was open. The astronauts were given uh, these biological isolation garments. And if you've ever seen that capsule, uh, the size of it, these astronauts are just crunched in there. It's amazing that they were able to take off those spacesuits sitting in those three chairs and put on those biological isolation garments. And they were in the raft, and then they were also washed down. And then the, the raft that I was in, uh, we pulled ourselves close, and we were lifeguarding. You can see my yellow tank there in the bottom left. Um, the AP pool gave us five cameras. Uh, to Mike Mallory, the guy in the front, he gave me one. And uh, I took this picture. I think it was the only one that came out without my thumb in the lens. <laughs> and you can see the astronauts waving. Someone asked, did they say anything to you? Yeah, they said, mm mm, -mm. <laughs> uh, We did a lot of hand signals because there's no way to really talk. And my first job when I swam up to the camps capsule was to uh, get a thumbs up as I looked in the window to let NASA above uh, let them know that they were okay. And you can see the astronauts going up in the Billy Punet, uh, one at a time into the helicopter. And uh, they're flown back to the USS Hornet where President Nixon was waiting to greet them along with Kissinger and a lot of dignitaries, former astronauts. And we're, we're left up there into the Pacific. <laughs> but uh, the astronauts are flown back. They come down the elevator and uh, they can barely walk uh, because they're learning how to do that from the gravity. And they go into this mobile quarantine facility and there's President Nixon greeting them there. You can see all of that online. We're still out in the ocean. <laughs> waiting for the USS Hornet to approach. And you say, well, what do you do while you're waiting? Well, we played king on a mountain and uh, goofed around a little bit. And you can see my flowers. On Apollo 10, we put a flower on that hatch window. And NASA was pretty uptight about it, and they told us no uh, fooling around in this one. So we had these flower decals, and you don't want to waste them, so I just put them all over my wetsuit. And it was the 1960s, if you recall those days. Yeah. And you can see my fellow teammates there, Mike Mallory on the right, and Wes Chester on the left. And uh, we were playing around on the water until the sharks came. And then we decided it's better to stay uh, on the capsule. <laughs> and uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., at the Smithsonian, they just asked me to send them that picture. They had it already. They just wanted permission to use it. And so uh, they got us right now. Maybe they'll have our correct picture in the museum. And, oh, peace signs. That was the 60s, remember? And we're still waiting for the ship. <clears throat> and uh, you can see my teammate there. He looks like he's got a headache or something. We never could figure out what he was doing. But you can see the ship approaching. And uh, this is the piece of that foil that I have on my wall back home. It's got some writing on it. You can see the ship there. Now you can see the size of the caps on the water. That ship is about uh, two football fields long or longer. And when that, caps, when that ship approaches the capsule, it looks like a little thimble in the bathtub or something that's 
uh, we're so thankful that they practiced and uh, they could approach us without running us over. My job was to stand on top of the capsule. The bosun may shot out of line and uh, one of the fellows grabbed it, handed it up to me. And then on that line, we pulled it and there was a cable that was stronger. I attached it to the, the loop that I'm hanging on to there. You can see the reinforced loop below it. And that's where I attached that cable. And the capsule was taken aboard the USS Hornet. <clears throat> and uh, we had to climb up a, a rope ladder. So they didn't give us a free journey. There you can see the capsule just as it uh, arrives on the ship. And you can see where <clears throat> that gold foil burned off. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, Mayor Daly flew us to Chicago, gave us the key to the city, wine and dined us. And uh, uh, those days after were very exciting. There's a picture out there with my wife, daughter at the Smithsonian uh, in Washington, D.C., the Jefferson exit there. So here we are on top of the world rescuing astronauts, but little did I understand how much at that time God was trying to rescue me. It was the 60s, and unfortunately, you know, it was a time when uh, there was a great change, especially in the youth. Young men begin to grow their hair long. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I got a frog in my throat. There was, uh, uh, you know, a, a great change in the 60s, early 60s on. We were invaded by these British singer groups, you know, with these weird animal names, the beetles, the birds, the monkeys, the turtles, the animals. <laughs> Girls wore flowers in their hair. Guys began to grow their hair long. We decorated up these minivans. We drove off into the sunset. The theme of the day was if you're not with the one that you love. There's my 60s group. Some of you young people, you don't know what's going on, do you? Some of you, you don't even know there's a moon up there, probably. But 50 years ago, this was really exciting. And so it was a, a, a change in the whole society. You know, we had the Haight-Ashbury system. We had um, Woodstock. Timothy Leary was uh, promoting the LSD. My teammates were older, older than me, and I roomed with some of them, and they began to um, introduce me to all these psychedelic drugs, the LSD, the masculine, and, and we smoked a pot and all that stuff. Excuse me. <coughs> and I never thought I'd be a drug experimenter, let alone abuser, but there was a f frustrating part of my life going on. My, my uh, high school was about 250 seniors. I come from a small town, about 7,000 and a half. I had lost three high school friends by that time, and, and I was headed back to Vietnam, and I really was concerned about going back to a war that wasn't really making a lot of sense at that time. When I was in junior high school, John F. Kennedy was voted in as our president, and he said, we're bearing your burden. We pay any price for freedom. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. You know, we stood in uh, the assemblies and we always said the Pledge of Allegiance. We sang the Star Spangled Banner. On Veterans Day, we went downtown. The high school band was marching by. Behind them were men who fought in, some of them still, World War II, the Korean War, and so forth. And we were just proud to be Americans. So when our government called on our generation to go fight in that war, we just went without any questions asked. But after we got over there, we soon discovered that this war was not being fought in a conventional way. Uh, it was a war of attrition, uh, you know, body counts. And, uh, you know, we took a hill and we lost hundreds of people during that. And then the next day we just left the hill alone and went on. And so, you know, the American public can only handle so much of that. The Look magazine, or I think it was the Life magazine, posted the faces of the boys that were killed over there in one week's time. There was 240 some faces of young men that were on that uh, magazine inside on those pages. And so the American public turned against the war. It was one of the most controversial wars that we've had since the Civil War. And I remember uh, in 1969 reading that 169 times a National Guard was called to college campus to stop the rioting. Governor Reagan closed down the schools 
uh, for four days. I'm talking about kindergarten all the way through the college system because of all the unrest going on in California. In Madison, Wisconsin, they blew up government buildings <coughs> to destroy the selected service records. Remember uh, Kent State, Ohio, the National Guard had been called there. The students were in town smashing windows. And then on the campus, they begin to do some minor rioting, and they thought they were going to burn down their ROTC building there. The National Guard was called. They were out there for several days. Nobody knows what happened, but up there on the knoll, where they were standing that day, and the students down, you know, harassing them. Somebody gave an order, and they begin to shoot into the crowd. Allison Krause is just 19. She lay dead on the sidewalk. Three of her classmates are laying beside her dead. There were nine others that were wounded. Some were so seriously wounded that they never got out of a wheelchair. And this is America. Let's not forget the racial tension that was going on all over America, especially in the South. Uh, we had the Black Panthers. We had uh, the Chicago Seven, you know, Jerry Rubin and all of them, the Democratic Convention. We got this weird music going on. We got this drug scene taking place. And all of this is happening at one time. They killed John F. Kennedy. They killed Martin Luther King. They killed Robert F. Kennedy. And this is the generation that I was raised in. They had the Manson clan, the Kennedy situation out there uh, with, you know, Mary Jo Kennedy, whatever her name was. And all of this taking place at one time, it was just a bizarre day in which to live. And now they were sending me back to the Vietnam War. I remember um, being quite messed up on drugs before I went, and then I continued on my second tour in Vietnam. They put us up in the Victoria Hotel. We were waiting for transportation down to the Mekong Delta, where I would serve my time and a very dangerous place that was heavily concentrated with Viet Cong activity deep down in the Mekong Delta Kamal Peninsula. Uh, the place called Sea Float, barges welded together with shacks on top, boats docked around it that would traverse all these little streams, and we were a part of all of that. Well, in that hotel room that night, I had dropped some LSD, and uh, the sun was setting. I remember walking across the room, pulling back the sliding glass door, standing out there on that balcony, and I could look off into the distance from the view of my hotel room. I could see that the war was still going on. You could see puffs of smoke way out in the distance. You could hear sound of gunfire. You could see the tracer bullets. You could see the parachute flares going off way in the distance. There was a military vehicle down below. Somebody was in there crying out to all the GIs to get inside because of their curfew that was effect. <clears throat> And the LSD trip uh, turned really weird and bad, and I went down to a very deep, dark place. And uh, the little cockroaches on the wall turned into monsters. In fact, the wall started breathing because of the LSD trip. The little ping in the bathroom with the, the faucet that's dripping sound like hammer blows, but the worst thing was these voices screaming at me from the inside. John, just look at yourself. Look what you've become. Look at the people you shunned, the people you hurt. But then I saw faces of Larry Smith and Gary Smith and Terry Beck, high school buddies of mine that had just died in that war. And uh, they, they, they hadn't even, I don't think, I think maybe one had turned 20, the other was 19, one was still 18 years old. Two of them died within the first three months, or two months, I believe. And one of them made it uh, five months in Vietnam. And these voices screamed at me and said, John, you're going to die over here. Why don't you just end your misery right now? I walked over to the bed. I'm under this influence of this drug, and my mind's not uh, functioning right. I pull, pull out that pistol from the holster, and I got it in my hand, and I'm ready to pull the trigger. And I heard a little voice, and that voice said, John, I'm here, and I love you. And I heard that voice one time before, when I was about seven years old. My mom and dad uh, divorced. And uh, my mom was left to raise five boys and a girl. We were all eight years and younger when that happened. My mom almost had several nervous breakdowns. I remember her crying all the time. I remember she used to, I don't know why, it seemed like she grabbed me and she would place her head on my chest and she would just sob. And my little, my little body couldn't handle that. I broke out in hives and I had migraines and, and I would... Uh, I wouldn't be able to spend the whole day in school because of those migraines, and I would throw up on the way home, and, and the doctor checked me out and said, it's probably just, you know, what's going on in the home life. I can't find anything physically wrong. But uh, I took the family wagon, and uh, we were poor, and 
I would go door to door, collect pop bottles. You'd take them down to the local grocery store and cash them in and get candy, you know. And it was on the way home when it happened. Uh, halfway down Lincoln Street to my house, I heard that voice for the first time. And it said the same thing, John, I'm here, I love you. I've got a plan for your life. That's all I heard. My earthly father wasn't there. He, was, he lived in another state. It was a rough time around the house. But my heavenly father that day reached down and gave me a hug. And for the first time, I realized that there was a God. I had gone to Sunday school. My mom sent us down to the corner of Trinity Lutheran Church, and they taught us the Bible stories while I was going to that Sunday school. My favorite one was when the shepherd left the 99 out there in the fold to go look for that one lost sheep. And that day, God found that one lost sheep down there and gave me a hug. And that was the beginning of a little relationship that didn't last very long because, you know, uh, life just goes on. But in that hotel room, that voice spoke for the second time. And I cried out and said, God, if that's you, please deliver me from this war. Deliver me from these drugs. I'll do anything, God. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know, there's a lot of plea bargaining that goes on in situations like that. Yeah. Someone said there are no atheists in foxholes. You know, the average fighting age of the Vietnam Warrior was about 19 and a half. Yeah. Young guys right out of high school. And uh, they went through some quick training, sent them right over to Vietnam for on-the-job training. A lot of them hadn't even started shaving yet. And when the chaplain would come in, I saw a lot of these boys go hear what the preacher had to say. You know, when you're in a type, tough spot, I'm, I'm talking to you right now. I think all of us, we know where to go. We know where the church is at. We know how to call a preacher. We know how to reach out to our friends that are serving God. But when things get better in our life, we also have a tendency to just put God on a shelf and go our own way. Well, in that hotel room, it wasn't salvation, but somehow God connected to me. And I'm thinking about this again today. Think about it now for yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm living in sin. I'm really confused. I'm messed up. I'm high on an LSD trip. But the God of mercy found me. The God of love found me. I didn't deserve grace. But you know what grace is? Grace is what we all need. We don't deserve it. <clears throat> there is a God that speaks a language that we all understand. Thank God for the church. Thank God for your wonderful pastor. Thank God for the family of God, the Christians. Thank God for Christians all over the world. But a lot of people don't ever walk into the house of God. They never walk into a church. But the God that spoke to me can speak to them. You might have a loved one a thousand miles away right now sitting on a bar stool. But the God that came into that hotel room can pull up a chair right next to them and speak a language that they understand. We need to realize that there is a God of creation that created you and I especially for himself. Better and bigger and brighter than any other creature on this earth. He put something on the inside of us, a little homing instinct that we all have an opportunity from the moment we are born to the time that we die. I believe God visits every human being through your conscience one way or the other because there's a God that loves you. There's a God that will not give up on anyone. And he found me that evening in a Vietnamese hotel room and gave me another hug caused me to put that gun down so I could live another day. I found myself down deep in the Mekong Delta where we were fired upon weekly, if not daily, on our operations. It wasn't long until one operation, two boats were called on. I was on one of them to go down a particular river and then down smaller streams to a point where we were supposed to make a stream wider so the boats that were going down there could get through. On the way there, we were ambushed. Those Viet Cong, that was their backyard. They just blended into the foliage. They had those little tunnels where they could come out of and then go back in. Well, they had water mines waiting for us underneath the water. 
They had Claymore mines up in the trees. They had B-40 rockets on both sides of that little stream. And they knew that when we got there, that they were going to do some damage that day. Our boat was seemingly lifted out of the water when the, when the, the mines went off underneath us. The B-40 rockets began to hit each side of that boat. They had the Claymore mines above and the shrapnel would come down on top of us. We fought back. We had a 105 cannon on both sides of that boat. We had two, th two 230s and a 50 on both sides of the boat. I had small arm fires along with some of my teammates. There were some troops down in the well of the boat and we were doing our best to fight. We had called in for helicopter support and they had not yet arrived. I felt pain, I slipped my hand down, came back full of blood. I realized I'd have taken shrapnel or something. The helicopters arrived. They directed their rockets and pinpoint accuracy on, on both sides of our boat. And pretty soon we got control. Our boat was damaged to the point where it had to be towed back to the base. When we got back to the base, we looked at the damage done to the boat. We saw that our boat was hit with eight of those B-40 rockets. I was behind a metal railing with two of my teammates there. On the other side, just within inches, was a B-40 rocket. The nose end was stuck into that metal grating and the tail end was still sticking out. It had not detonated. If it would have, I probably wouldn't be here this morning sharing my story. And you say, well, that's a coincidence. Those things happen. Sure they do. But how many of you believe in angels? Do you know in your Bible, in the book of Hebrews, it says, are they not all ministering spirits? Send forth to minister to those that shall be heirs to salvation. I was not an heir yet, but God knew that I would be someday. You know what's going to blow our minds, folks? We, I think some of you know. You can look back in your life. You should have drowned that day. You could have got killed in that car wreck. You could have died in the hospital. There's so many things that have gone on in your life that you can attribute to the hand of God bringing you through. But it's going to blow our minds someday when we get to the other side and God begins to reveal to us all the times that God sent divine intervention and we don't even know it. I tell you, there's a God that loves you. There's a God that cares about you. There's a God that knows your name. There's a God that has your address and he speaks a language that every man and woman can understand. There is a God, and he created you, and he loves you, and he'll, he'll come to your side over and over again throughout your life to get your attention, because he does not want you to be lost. He's made a place for us in eternity, and he wants you there. And until you take your last breath, He'll be working on you to get your attention. I can guarantee that. Because he loves you. Because of that leg wound, I was air back to a hospital. When they dug out the lead, I left a long hole up my leg. They had to pack it with this huge pieces of gauze and dress it. it. Took a long time to heal. So I went from one hospital to the other. But it was really a blessing in disguise because it took me out of a very dangerous place and put me in a safer place. Yes. I was in Cameron Bay, my last stop, a recuperation hospital. And just to let you know how bad the drugs were in Vietnam, at least my part of Vietnam, when I got to the hospital, they put us in a little room for a briefing and they said, listen, there's drugs all over here. We can't control it. Last night there we found a guy out on the beach. He overdosed and he's dead. We can't stop this. So you just need to watch out for yourself because it's out of control. I thought it was a come on. But uh, that night at a movie when they showed some films there on the outside for the entertainment that those could make it out to the bleachers, I saw officers and enlisted walking around through those bleachers selling dope like it was popcorn. Everybody was getting high. Well, I was looking at the calendar. I saw that my unit would be transferring out. 
I wanted to transfer out of Vietnam with them to go back to the Philippines and then back to the United States. So I went to the, the doctors in the office and I asked them to give me orders, please, to go back to my unit. They wouldn't let me go. They wouldn't discharge me because my leg wasn't healed enough yet. But I learned what persistence is. You just keep going back and you annoy them to the point where they just want to get rid of you. <laughs> they gave me orders, gave me some dressings, some bandages, and sent me on my way. And back in those days, in order to get around Vietnam, you just kind of had to hitchhike your way through. And my first ride was with two civilian pilots working over there, making money. And we're in a little Piper plane, we're taking off, we're getting altitude. And we almost got knocked out of the sky by some jets. They dove down, we, and I'm thinking inside, you know, there's so many ways to die over here. I finally hitchhiked my way back to Saigon where I'd get a, another ride down to where my team was. I went back to the hotel, Victoria, where uh, I ran into some SEAL team friends on R&R. &R. They were happy to see me, but I could sense something was wrong, and they said, you haven't heard, have you? And I said, heard what? Well, while you were recuperating in the hospital, we lost five of our SEAL team guys. I said, you're kidding, who? And when he shared their names, it blew my mind because they were on sea float, exactly where I was, roomed right next to me. Three of the boys that were killed that day went through the same training class that I went through. And I'm thinking, God, why me? Why, why are my buddies dead? Why, why three high school friends, five SEAL team buddies? Well, why did 58,000 American boys die over there? And why did some of us make it home alive? I really don't have those kind of answers. But I do believe this, that when God looked down in that hotel room, when I was on that LSD trip with a gun in my hand, I believe he saw a little smoke down here. Not much, just a glimmer. And that's all God ever needs to see in any human being. If there's just a small segment of your heart that's open to God, just a little smoke down there. I believe the angels in heaven will come to your side. And I believe they'll fan that little desire until it begins to burn enough. Because God knows if he can ever burn enough, he can get your attention. And if he can get your attention, he can draw you in. And if he can draw you in, he can lead you to salvation so you can spend eternity with him. Well, I knew it was God that brought me out of Vietnam. But when I landed back in the United States, I didn't run to the first church and get saved either. That's not what most human beings do. It seems like most human beings run as fast as they can away from God. It seems like it's God that's chasing us around. And uh, he's, he just kept at it. For the next year, I was still wiped out in drugs. Everywhere I would go, I'd hear this voice that I heard in that hotel room getting louder and louder saying, John, I've got something better. I've got something better. I've got something better. Sometimes it takes a while to get through our thick skulls what God's trying to do. But God loved me like he loves you. And uh, in Vietnam, I received uh, another stripe, now E5. They called it a Ho Chi Minh. I guess when you get shot, they... they I don't know. I guess they reward you. So I should have got shot again. I just kept going up the ladder. <clears throat> well, they put me in charge of the intelligence division as an enlisted man on our team, and they had one officer over me, and I had several under me. But they brought in a young man that would work with me, which was quite unique because uh, he had not gone through the UDT training, the SEAL training, the Hell Week, and all of that. That's why it was unusual. But God knew what he was doing. He was a good Baptist boy. And he knew that God was dealing with me. Because out of one side of my mouth, it was, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And out of the other side of my mouth, it was just me, Weird John. You know, I was smoking dope, living an immoral life, getting high every day, maybe twice a day, maybe three times a day. And talking about Jesus all the time. I needed some direction. He knew it. He started giving me literature to read. And then I bought a Bible. And then I began to read the Bible. 
You know, my father was a Rosicrucian. He died without knowing the Lord, as far as I know. All my life, he tried to indoctrinate me and my brothers in his belief system. In Vietnam, he sent me literature to read. I was seeking out palm readers. I was getting involved in self-hypnosis. I was just one really weird guy. You know what I was doing? I was looking for God. I was looking for an answer. You know, listen to this. People that seek God may not find truth. But if you seek truth, you will always find God. So after reading the Bible a while, I, I, I just knew enough, you know, I had enough common sense to realize that people that read the Bible usually go to church. And so I went church shopping in Coronado. I think I went to every church that I could find. And I think there's something with, inside every human being that when you get to a point where you and God are starting to connect, I think there's some compass in there that this tells you to go to an altar. Yeah. Well, I went to an altar in this one church, but I don't think people went to an altar there. Because I was the only one down there. And all of a sudden, everything got quiet. And I got the feeling like I just messed up this place. <laughs> I started feeling pretty awkward. And uh, it was uncomfortable for a while. And then a couple of nice guys came and helped me up and took me to a, a back room somewhere so they could carry on their normal service. I'm not making fun. fun. This, is, this is what happened. And I think they probably led me to a sinner's prayer. And when I left that church that day, I was so excited about what just happened to me. Do you know this walk that we have called Christianity or life? It, it's a constant revelation. And every step along the way is big. Every step along the way is huge. Every step along the way is exciting. And when I left that church that morning, I was excited. That's the first time I ever gone that far. Right. And I'm rejoicing. Yeah. And then it hits me. I'm going to go home and get high. <laughs> because I'm addicted. Every day, that's what I do. Sunday as well. Maybe more on Sunday than the other days because I'm not working. And so I have a little conversation with the Lord. And I say, God, on the way home, I said, if this is all you got... I, I'm not going to make it. I said, where's the power? And when you start asking those kinds of questions, God's got the answer. And do you know my answer came about two and a half minutes later? Because I lived up above a garage and back in this alley. And as I approached the stairs that led up to that little apartment in this alley, was a paper called a reminder. I normally would just pick it up and throw it in the trash. But that little voice says, pick it up. And I did. I opened it. I saw a little advertisement. Pentecostal Church Revival Begins, Imperial Beach, California. I, be, I read through it. It said, those interested in the experience of receiving the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues can come and find out more about it. And I never heard of this thing called speaking in tongues. But it sounded really cool to me. So I made up my mind I'm going to go to that church when it started the following week. But you know the devil doesn't ever want you to go. So that Sunday night before the re I was going to go to the revival, there was a knock on my door. There was a couple of my friends. They're partying. They're already high on something. They got a little bag of drugs. Come on, John. Party time. But you know what I did that night? What I did is what every individual needs to do if they're really going to be serious about finding God. I drew a line. And I said to my buddies, no. I said, I wake up in the morning and I look in that mirror over there and I can't stand what looks back at me. 
I said, that's not me. That's what the drugs and the alcohol and the lifestyle's done. I'm sick and tired of this. I don't want to live like this anymore. I want God. I said, I'm going to go to church. And when I said church, they made a beeline for the door. <laughs> Listen, when, when God is working on you, that's your personal invitation. Yes. You can't wait for the wife. You can't wait for the husband. You can't wait for your friends. You can't wait for the family. When God comes knocking on your heart door, that's the time that you need to make a decision. And you don't know how many times he's going to knock on your door so you can hear it. So I look around my apartment for that newspaper that had the address. I can't find it. I thought my roommate had thrown it out in the trash. So I go down the stairs to the alley. I start digging through our trash can. It's not there. So what do desperate people do? You just walk down that long alley going through everybody else's trash can. <laughs> I saw people staring at me from their back windows, and they're pointing at me. And I, you know, who cares? Who cares? I finally found a wet, soggy paper with the address. I ran back to my Ford van, squealed down the alleyway, headed down to Marietta, down to the Silver Strand, headed south. You know, I'm getting pretty good at hearing this little voice, and God said, are you going to go by yourself? So I just passed the Navy base, turned around, went to the barracks, started knocking on all these doors to see if my friends wanted to go. Nobody did. So I went down to the parking lot, got into my Ford van, started up the ignition. That's when Rick Whitcomb pulled up. He rolled down his window. I rolled down mine. He said, hey, John, what's up? I said, I'm going to go to church. You want to join me? Okay. You know, God knows what he's doing. We found that little Pentecostal church, and I mean it's little. And when we walked in, they didn't need warm-up. And the pastor said, listen, if you would have come a couple of months before this, you might not have had this experience. You know that all churches go through times when it's just kind of, you know, mundane a little bit. Even Pentecostal churches. And there's nothing worse than a dead Pentecostal church. So the pastor, he got up one Sunday night. And he looked at his congregation. And he said, anybody in here sick and tired of dead church? And nobody would raise their hand. Because they're all dead. He said, well, my wife and I are going to show up in the morning. And we're going to start a morning prayer meeting. And it was just two of them, and then three, and then four, and then 16, and then 30, and then half the church were coming early in the morning. I'm talking about 5 o'clock in the morning, having early morning prayer. You know what happens when you do that? You change the atmosphere. Somebody said, Pastor, why don't you call in an evangelist? Somebody else said, I'm going to put an advertisement in the paper. Well, those prayers went up down the Silver Strand to the community of Coronado, down that little alley, right one, about two and a half minutes before, I said, God, if this is all you got, I'm not going to make it. Where's the power? And I picked up that little paper, and it was like a magnet that just led me right into that church. And now we're standing there, and the place is just exploding. And my friend is freaking out. And I got them blocked in. I got the end seat. And the only way out is through me. Because the rest of that row went to the wall. And he said, I'm out of here. And I said, you're not. I said, there's something going on here I want to see through and figure out. And I'm so glad that I hung out. Because that night something got a hold of me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Yeah. That evangelist was preaching from the book of Acts. 
He was talking about the birthday of the church. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were one place, one accord. He said, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they're sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of the fire. And they all began to speak in tongues. I said, there it is. That's what I read. I'm listening. He got up and talked about the upper room, the 120. But then he talked about Peter. Peter preaching about Jesus Christ, this one you folks out there just crucified. And after they felt convicted, after he preached about the Messiah, they cried out, men and brethren, what must you do? And Peter had a good answer. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, the promise is unto you and your children and to those that are far off. And there's this voice inside saying, go, go, go. Amen, amen. But my feet kept saying, no, no. <laughs> you know, all that God ever wants is a step. Yes. Somehow I took a step. That's all I remember. I'm down at an altar crying out to God because my life is so full of corruption, so full of sin. There's so many things I need to talk to God about. I don't know how long I was down there, but there was a moment my hands were lifted up towards heaven and I was speaking a language I never spoke before. I look over to my right and there's my buddy Rick. He's speaking in tongues. And you know what uh, most Pentecostal church do after that? They said, have you ever been water baptized? I said, well, I got an appointment at this other church in about three weeks, but that didn't seem to bother them. They opened up their Bible, Acts 2, uh, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. And then they took me back to Acts 2, those that gladly received the word. I said, well, I'm glad. Baptize me. They had an organ over here. Two big guys grabbed the organ and they moved it over a little bit. Under the organ is a little throw rug. They roll up the rug and there's a trap door. Open up the trap door and there's a the water. Listen, if you've never gone down in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, because the Bible said if you... Have somebody call on that name. Jesus died for your sins. It was his blood that was shed. Hebrews said without the shedding of blood there's no remission. But when you go down in the name of Jesus. Your sins are washed away. It's fire as the east. Fire as the west. And when I came up out of that water. All my sins remain under the water. I was free. Hallelujah. I've never felt so good in my life. I wanted to hug everybody. So I think somebody wrote a song about it. It's real. It's real, this Pentecostal experience. Someone else wrote a song, there's a new man walking in my shoes. I think the Apostle Paul said it this way, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are new. Yeah. On the way back to Coronado, I'm looking across the San Diego Bay, and I see thousands of lights, which represented buildings with people inside, and I just said, everybody needs to know what happened to me. Everybody needs to know what Jesus can do. I went back to my apartment, and I went on a search and destroy mission. I grabbed a pillowcase, filled it up with all the hashes and marijuana and all the pills I could find, and the paraphernalia, the water pipe, and all that stuff. And I drove down to the San Diego Bay, and I baptized. <laughs> I went back to my apartment and got two cardboard boxes, 
empty and filled it up with stuff that I borrowed from the Navy. And the next morning, I laid those two boxes on the executive officer's desk, and he looked, he looked at me like I lost my mind because everybody borrowed stuff and never took it back from me. I said, sir, there's been a change in my life. I've become a raging maniac for Jesus. They would see me coming, and they would run in every direction. But I could run as fast as they could. And I would just catch up. Locker room, shower, it didn't matter. In their car, in their home. <laughs> they finally got together and said, John's going to drive us nuts. We might as well just go and get it over with. <laughs> I had a Ford van. No seats in the back. They're crammed in there like sardines. I'm driving them to church for the first time. I look back in the mirror and Nick, my roommate at the time, is passing this brown sack around. I said, well, Nick, what's in that sack? He said, whiskey. So what are you doing with whiskey? So I'm trying to get enough courage to go to church with you. <laughs> I said, put it away. You don't need that. But here's the beautiful thing. I mean, this is amazing. I'm talking about young men who have gone through SEAL team training. They've been to Vietnam. They've been to jump school, diving school, survival school. You know, they think they're tough and macho. And then they come into that little church. Amen. And the same thing that happened to me began to happen to them. Amen. I saw... Oh, I don't know. A dozen or more come to that altar, repent of their sins, get baptized in the name of Jesus. But as your pastor said in previous notes here before service, the best thing about it was, <coughs> let me just let you wait on that a minute. About 18 years after this all happened, I took Art Hodges, a friend of mine, down to the training unit. <coughs> he wanted to see how the SEALs were trained. We're walking through. I have a book. And I give it to the captain of the training unit. And we're walking through, and he's reading it a little bit. And he goes, you're the guy. I said, what do you mean I'm the guy? He said... We still talk about that. And that's 18 years later. He wasn't even around there then. I said, why? He said, because it changed so many lives. He and his wife and his three kids came out to hear me that Sunday. God changes lives. Can you stand with me a moment? Out of that group of frogmen that were coming to the Lord, five of us were called into the ministry. Jim Galone is pastoring the church where we got saved. He just retired. Tommy Bracken still doing work in Taiwan, missionary. Nick Nicholson was an evangelist until he passed away with cancer. Ramos is working in Puerto Rico. And here I stand, a miracle of God's grace and mercy, in Jesus' name. Do you know that God loves you? I'm going to ask the congregation to just come and stand with me, would you please? If you're a guest, you're welcome. When anybody shares a testimony of God's love and goodness, everybody reminisces about their journey about what God has done for you about what God has done for you and I want you to just come and stand a moment I want you to take take a few seconds here maybe a little longer and just in your heart in your mind thank God for the journey that he prepared for you to get you to where you are right now the beautiful thing about life and understanding that there's a God that there's always more that he wants to share there's always more that he wants to reveal and I don't know where you may be in this journey I'm 70 years old and God is still revealing good things and new things to me.
You may be at step one, you may be at step 50, I don't know. But this journey is wonderful. When you meet God and you, you unite with God and He fills you with His Spirit, that's just the beginning. But somehow you got here. Somehow He broke through. When I look back now from this side of Calvary after I've been serving God, all the way back to when I was just a little boy, I can see the hand of God working in my life. That little lady that would cross the street and just pat me on the head and give me a hug and say, Jesus loves you. That's Sunday school. Jesus loves you. All through my life until I finally ended up at an altar, I can look and see God arranged that. God put that person there. That situation brought me closer. Really, this whole thing's about God. We didn't get here by accident. God found you. God came to you. God called you. You didn't call him. And somewhere in this journey of life, he's working in your life. I don't know if it's in the very beginning or if you're in the middle. But he's not finished. And he speaks a language. I said he speaks a language that you and I, everyone can understand. Would you just lift your heart to the Lord? Would you thank him for where you are in this journey? Would you thank him? He, he's revealed himself to somebody here. He's doing a work in your life. He's a good God. A merciful God. A God of love. A God of grace. A God of mercy. Hallelujah. Why don't you just thank the Lord. Call on His name. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Why don't you put your hand on a brother or sister? Why don't you unite together right now? Thank God for my brother, my sister. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
in our ministries and our some of our key saints and give a good for those that are around you know. There's a beautiful presence of God here right now. You just lift your hands under the Lord and just begin to worship Him. something very profound that was said here this morning by Brother Wolfram. He says, you know, many people seek for God, but they don't find Him. But when you seek for truth, you will find God. And I recall many years ago, I had heard myself many things about the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. I didn't know much about it, but it seems like there's a lot of conflict in regards to it. But God took me to a Bible study that I didn't know the people had the Holy Ghost there. If I had known that, I wouldn't have gone. But because God had his hand upon me, just like God has his hand upon each and every one of us here today. I said, God has his hand upon you right now. And God is here. If you will come forth for truth, you will find God. Yes. But that night I discovered in the Bible study about 20 people, they all had the Holy Ghost. They all spoke in tongues. I didn't say anything to anybody that night. But the following day, I talked to the Lord. And this is what I said to God. I said, God, when I get home from work today, 
I said, I'm going to open up my Bible. And I'm going to see what your word has to say about this. You see, I was now looking for truth. And when I went home, and I opened up my Bible, I want to know what truth is about this. I discovered in the Word of God. And in two days' time, in the living room, God came in that living room. God's right here this morning. He also mentioned just taking that one little step. Everything within you can say no. Okay? But if you don't listen to that no, and you just take that little step, this little step of faith, that little step, God is right here. Truth is here. And God will baptize you with the power of his love. God will baptize you and transform your life. When God came in that living room there, and I was sitting there all by myself praying, he walked right up in front of me there. He did a miracle. I said, God, if this is of you, then God, you just let it happen. And as soon as I said that there, I was speaking in an unknown language. But not only was I speaking in an another unknown language, there was power of love that entered into me. There was God, amen, not standing on the outside of me now, but God who now by his spirit was living inside of me. And because God came that Thursday night in 1977, on an October evening, my life was changed ever since then. Ever since then. And I would never go back beyond that time. I like the musicians to sing a little. But I'm opening up this front part here. I want to invite you to come. God wants to fill you. There's no question of what God wants to do. There is no question, does God want to do this in my life? The question is, will you allow God to do it? He's here. And I'd like to give you an invitation. Not trying to embarrass anybody. Amen. But give you a simple invitation to come let's lay hands on you and you just raise your hand and you raise your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ amen and God will transform your life God will fill you with the power of his love that is what you are receiving when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost amen you are receiving the power of God's love is there anybody here amen you know God loves you you know God loves you. You know God loves you. Amen. But God doesn't want you to know that he just loves you. Amen. He wants you to experience his love. Amen. And the way you experience his love is you allow him to enter in. You allow him to come into your heart. You allow him. Amen. To take his love and now come and dwell inside of you. And when you leave here today. You will not leave the same as you came. I know right now, I can call some people out right now, but I'm not here to embarrass anybody. But musician, if you just play right now, I give an invitation. I give an invitation right here. We have one brother right here. Some of the elders that can come. Amen. We're going to pray. In the name of Jesus, you are welcome here at this altar right here. In the name of Jesus now. That's right. Just lift your hand right now. God loves you. Hallelujah now. God loves you.
so we have ministers that are up here by the platform and any one of them if you'll come to them they'll 
We have some that are getting prepared to be baptized now. Amen. There's such a there's something so timeless about the Spirit of God that moves in every generation. Times change, technology changes. But the human spirit's need for God never changes. And it flows the same from generation to generation. If you're here this morning, you want to talk to one of our ministers about it, just ministers, if you would, kind of turn and face the congregation so they know who you are, the elders. You can come to any one of those. Amen. Amen. Beautiful presence of God here. Let's just worship the Lord just a moment. We'll be done here in a couple minutes, but I just want to... I just want you to feel this love of God. There's a lot of different people that are getting connected with God that haven't in a long time. Hallelujah. Let's rejoice with this brother that's being baptized in Jesus' name.